All right, it's 7 p.m. It's time for Jeopardy. My name is Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. Get my screen up here. We are going tonight with our second round of Jeopardy. We've listened to people and they want a challenging addition. We wanted something a little bit more for the medics, a little something to challenge the EMTs. That's what we're doing tonight. So, my name's Dan Lemmer. I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer. Ooh. All right, it's 7 p.m. It's time for Ooh. Jeopardy. My name is Dan Lemmer from Lemmer Education. Sorry about nice that. Screen up here. We are going tonight with our second round of Jeopardy. We've listened to people and... All right, we're trying that again. Dan Lemmer, ooh, Chief Knowledge Officer from Lemmer Education. We are a company that's designed to help people study and pass the National Registry. I've been an EMS for a long time, uh, police work as well for most of my uh, adult life. I do a few textbooks, but most importantly tonight, we're going to be talking about Jeopardy, especially the challenging Jeopardy. And good evening. Hello, those of you that are saying hi in the chat. Just a couple things as we go. I will be putting up the Jeopardy board. We have five categories. We have farm facts. We have medical mysteries. We have diagnostic dilemmas. We have traumatic trivia, and we have clinical clues. So those are the topics. Now there's a little bit of a delay from when I speak to when you hear me and respond. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. If you have a topic that you would like to do, put that topic in and put your answers in to the uh, chat here as well. All right. So as we go through farm facts, medical mysteries, diagnostic dilemmas, traumatic trivia, and clinical clues, put your choices and your answers in that. I have the first question comes up. Will this edition of Jeopardy help prepare for the NREMTB exam? Actually, it will. And it'll do it in a couple of different ways. One is you're going to get some of the more challenging things that you'll see. You'll make some links. But I'll talk on a couple of these. There's a few of these that might even be distractors that you'll be able to avoid because you saw them here. All right, farm facts for 500. We are going for the big ones. Now, as you know, uh, as we get down into the 500s, the questions become more challenging. We got somebody going for it uh, right now. Here we go. All right, Columbus, Indiana EMT class. I'm gonna say hi, but I'm not gonna say your name here in doing that. And here we go. Medications that end in Prill are from this class of antihypertensive medications. Medications that end in Prill are from this class of antihypertensive medications. And this takes a second for me to see some answers coming up here. Uh, it's if someone tells you that they have a medication that they take, it's handy to know those suffixes. Prill is one of those. All right, we're getting a couple answers coming in here. And the correct answer is ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. Now, we had a couple answers in here that weren't quite right, but let's talk about them. Beta blockers, they end in OLOL. -L. They would be metoprolol, atenolol, those are beta blockers. The ACE inhibitors are enalapril and captopril. Those are the ACE inhibitor medications. So it's good that we went through and we did that. All right, as we go back to the board, I've had a request for medical mysteries for 100. I'm gonna put that up. That's gonna come out to you in a second. This is a clinical term. 
that I'm looking for. I put the definition up here. And here we go. This condition causes brief unresponsiveness and a loss of postural tone. I'll say that one more time. This condition causes brief unresponsiveness and loss of postural tone. Now, Flavio, you were here before. I remember you. And that's a good answer, by the way. I'll just give it a second for a few other people to do it. Yes. Jay County's advanced EMT class is back. Welcome. Sunshine Scotty and Elliot have got some good answers as well. Let's show that answer so we can move on. This condition causes brief unresponsiveness and loss of postural tone. The answer is syncope. And that is the true medical definition. Now, okay, it's a little stuffy. Let me put it in better terms for you. The patient passes out and they fall down, right? That is ultimately syncope, that postural tone. They can't stay up anymore, right? All of a sudden, something is stopping blood flow to the brain. Sometimes it's simple fainting. Sometimes it's a cardiac rhythm problem. But the hallmarks of syncope are that it is quick and it's also quick to resolve, right? If a person, if you get to a person and you have a five minute response time or a 10 minute response time and they're still out, it's probably not syncope. So remember that it's self-correcting and it's brief, brief unresponsiveness, loss of postural tone. That's the medical way of saying, well, we fell down and that's that. All right, I'm going to go across the top a little bit. I'm going to go over to clinical clues. Please make sure that you put your choices in here. I think you can see where I'm going. I've got a little bit more challenging than we did last time. Here we are going out. Levine's sign looks like this. That's my Jeopardy voice. Levine's sign looks like this. What is Levine's sign? I got a request to go back to medical mysteries. We can do that next. Flavio is first and right again. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Levine's sign is a closed fist to the chest. Like this, taking that fist and putting it up to the chest. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an MI, but what it does usually mean is it's a relatively high number on that 1 to 10 chest pain scale, often correlated to 7 to 10 on that chest pain scale. It's called Levine's sign, that closed fist to the chest. If you see that when you get to a scene, it's significant and you should pay attention to it. Medical Mysteries for 200 coming up by request right now. The process of breaking glycogen down into usable glucose. The process of breaking glycogen down into usable glucose. Now, while you're answering this, I'm just going to say quickly that someone asked, is this going to be uh, valuable for the NREMT exam, even at the basic level? And I'm going to say yes, because I'm giving you some deep cuts here. Now, you may see this word. It's a good word. It's a juicy word uh, to be able to do this. And we know that the body, when we have a little bit of extra sugar, we tuck it away as glycogen, right? Our blood glucose gets up to about 140. We release insulin. We kind of get that sugar into the cells. We have some left. What do we do? We store it, the liver and the muscle. 
But if we need it again, we need some glucose for a rainy day, we can break that glycogen down. All right, this is a tougher question. Here's the answer. Glycogenolysis. The olysis is breaking that down. We're taking glycogen, breaking it down into glucose glycogenolysis. All right, going back into our test, I don't have any immediate choices here. Diagnostic dilemmas for 100. Here we go. Very popular thing today. We've heard the FAST scale. Now a lot of people are using BFAST. The B in BFAST stands for this. Hello, Alicia, one of our, one of our people at Just Past Your Paramedic. Congratulations again. It's great seeing you there. The B in BFAST stands for this. And this is really important. All right. Get another request or going into some trauma. We can most certainly do that. And we have some great answers here that the B stands for balance. Why is that important? The B and the E have been added because of large vessel occlusion strokes that the fast scale may not see. So by checking for balance or any type of ataxia or uncoordinated movement, E is eyes. Any loss of vision or double vision that may go with that. By adding those in there, I think we get a much better stroke scale. And I'm glad that we could bring that up here, something that's relatively new and very important. So I have a request for trauma for 300. Dramatic trivia. We're going right down the middle for 300. Here we go. This is the point where the trachea bifurcates into the main bronchi. If you're intubating, you don't want your tube to go this far. It's about to take a wrong turn. The point where the trachea bifurcates into the main bronchi. Oh, hello, Montana. I was just out there in November. You guys are cool and fun. Here we go. All right, we're getting some great answers in here now. <laughs> 300, 300 points or dollars goes to the carina, is that point where the trachea bifurcates. Now the trachea, when it bifurcates, doesn't bifurcate at even angles. The right angle is a little more gentle, and if we are going to have our tube go down into any one of the bronchi, it's going to be generally into the right. Coming back. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool and funny. I'll take it. Looks like we're going to... Right, I'm going to clear out these 100s while I'm waiting for things. The term for a flap of skin that is torn away from the body. The term for a flap of skin that is torn away from the body. This is from the soft tissue injuries section of your course, whether you're an EMT or paramedic. Hello, Donald. <laughs> All right, I'm cooler, funnier, and cuter. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna take it. I don't know why, but I'm just gonna take that. All right, term for a flap of skin torn away from the body. Here we go. We're getting okay. Owie is not exactly what I'm looking for. Avulsion, however, is a piece of skin torn away is an avulsion. But remember, we have lacerations. We have amputations, we have eviscerations when parts of our abdominal contents are exposed to the outside world, but an avulsion is when, a, when a, some skin has been torn away. 
One of those types of avulsions is called a glove avulsion, which can be seen around machinery where somebody's hand is taken in and the skin is pulled off the hand like a glove. That's a glove avulsion. All right, I'm clearing out. I'm going to farm facts for 100. This common nitroglycerin side effect is also seen in erectile dysfunction meds. This common nitroglycerin side effect is also seen in erectile dysfunction medications. Spelling does not count. All right, we're getting some answers in, and we're kind of torn in the answers here between headache and hypotension. The common nitroglycerin side effect is headache. And why do we get that? Because nitroglycerin is vasodilates. Our head doesn't like to have our vessels vasodilated, and sometimes it gives us a headache. But what do erectile dysfunction meds do? Erectile dysfunction meds cause some dilation. It helps engorge the penis and make it erect, but it can also work in other parts of the body. Now, since nitroglycerin and erectile dysfunction meds work in the same way, now we understand why it's bad if someone has taken nitroglycerin within 48 hours or a little bit longer with Tadalafil going up to 72 hours. We know why those two medications may cause what some of you have said, and that is hypotension. Those medications combination can do that. Nitroglycerin can, but the one we're talking about here is headache. I could have put that answer up there. I was too busy teaching. All right, let's go on. We have any other choices? Put me, give me some choices there in that chat so we can go through, go through and do these. I'm just gonna pick these randomly now. I'm gonna go to Diagnostic Dilemmas for 200. You will see this in a patient experiencing meiosis. You will see this in a patient experiencing meiosis. All right, we got lots of, lots of choices coming in. I like that, but we can do all of those. Going to trauma next. How do these things how do these things work for the National Registry? Because the National Registry is big on terms. That's one of the things anybody doing this to prepare for the National Registry will get will be terms. But we've got a lot of choices come through, not always, not always correct. This is often seen in a narcotic or an opioid overdose. However, the term meiosis means constriction of the pupils. In that opioid overdose, we will see constricted, or sometimes pinpoint pupils. Interestingly, almost all opioids will do that, but not all. Some of the synthetic opioids might not give us that pupillary constriction, so we always make sure we look at the whole picture as we go through these things. All right, so we're going to traumatic trivia was our next request, and we're going there for 200. A patient has burns on his anterior chest. The body surface area percentage is this amount. A patient has burns on his anterior chest. The body surface area percentage is this amount.
I don't call people out for wrong answers. I love that people are putting in choices. And we're getting a couple different answers. I'm going to explain how the rule of nines can sometimes be an issue for us. Because we're getting both 9 and 18. Now let's look at this. The correct answer is 9%. And why is that? Because we're only talking about the chest, right? From the shoulders down to the rib cage and not the belly. The torso is 18%, but the chest is 9%. There's a couple different ways we get rule of nine questions wrong. One is a reading issue, right? If we look at it and we don't read and comprehend what we're looking for, you picture the torso, but it's really asking for the chest. Now, the other time we can get a math problem. If I have part of my arm and part of my leg and my abdomen, okay, it could be a math issue. Then, of course, you have to know the parts of the rule of nines to make this work. The Advanced Burn Life Support course for the advanced providers out there say we tend to underestimate BSA, yet we still over-resuscitate fluid-wise in the field. All right, coming back to, we have pharmacology fact request for 200. These are the two main contraindications for aspirin. These are the two main contraindications for aspirin. Now I did say main, and remember that there are relative contraindications as well, and there are some other things out there we want to be careful of, but people are starting to get this as we, as we see the couple that I'm looking for. One is obviously an allergy to aspirin, and number two is an active GI bleed. Now if the patient has had a GI bleed in the past, and it appears to have resolved, we can still give uh, an aspirin. It's just that current GI bleed, or if a doctor has said, no, I don't want you to ever take an aspirin, okay, we're going to listen. But we do have some other things, and that's going to come up in a subsequent, that's going to come up in a subsequent Jeopardy topic. All right, let's go on. I've got some more requests here. Let me go down and find that again. All right, clinical clues is next. Clinical clues for 200. Oh, this is one of my favorite words. Don't judge me. Passing bright red blood with stool is called this. Passing bright red blood with stool is called this. There is a term for this. Oh, J County EMS pulls it out. I like it. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not melana. Melana is the dark, tarry, sticky, unusually malodorous um, things that we get. But we have people are now flooding in with the correct term, and that is hematochesia. See, that's just, okay, now I'm a total nerd, but that's just one of those words. You're like, oh, I'm going to use that someday, called hematochesia. All right. So we're getting down. We're working the board down here. We haven't done a lot of diagnostic dilemmas yet. Let's go there for 300. 
McBurney's point helps you locate this. All right, we're getting some answers in there. Joe Mama needs some love here. All right, we're splitting it up with some of the abdominal organs. The correct answer is the appendix. The correct answer is the appendix for McBurney's point. When you find that point, you're going to find the appendix. Now, the appendix that is, is visceral pain, at least in the beginning. It's an organ. It isn't innervated particularly well. Because of that, we sometimes feel pain around the belly button at around T10. That's where the appendix reports back into the spine, and it sometimes is confusing. Eventually, it will go down into the point McBurney's point where the appendix is located. If you're palpating a belly, many times you have to go behind the go below the belt line to actually find where the appendix is. All right, so appendix was the correct answer there. I haven't had any recent requests. I'm going to start clearing the board a little bit with medical mysteries for 300. This common pain reliever can induce asthma. This common pain reliever can induce asthma or an asthma attack. All right, clinical clues for 300. We'll get that next. This common pain reliever can induce asthma. Yeah, there, there actually is a, a class of drug. I will give you a hint. There is a term for it called AIA. Some people say that it's a contraindication to a certain medication, but it certainly is a caution. And yes, the correct answer is aspirin. But other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may still be the case, but aspirin-induced asthma is rare, but it is a thing. And that's why we're doing it in Challenging Trivia tonight. All right, so we have clinical clues. We're going to go to clinical clues for 300. Here we go. Ooh, polydipsia is a term for this. And again, this is why I think this is good preparation for the National Registry, because you're getting terminology here at any level that you're doing this. Polydipsia is a term for this. I just saw Patrick Germain on here. The Patrick Germain? The famous colony Patrick Germain? Yes, we're getting this. This is a great thing that you know this. Of course, we could say excessive thirst, but polydipsia is the term. One of the three polys in hyperglycemia, polydipsia, polyuria, excessive urination, and polyphagia, excessive hunger. So we're thirsty. Why are we thirsty? Because once our blood glucose starts to get high, about 180 to 200, the kidneys say, holy cow, we got a lot of sugar here. We got to do something about this. And it starts pulling sugar into the urine. But that big glucose molecule, when it goes, it takes water with it, which is why you pee more. 
which ultimately is polyuria. But since you get dehydrated, it's why you're thirsty. So we've really got to watch. If you can say, oh, they've got a little high blood glucose, they're 200 or whatever. But that's when problems really, really start. All right. So we're doing farm facts for 300 by request. This cardiac rhythm is known to cause strokes. This cardiac rhythm is known to cause strokes. <laughs> Hi, Pat. Here we go. You know, these connections are so important. Uh, an EMS at any level. <laughs> Don't worry about the username. I am totally good. This is an EMS thing. Nobody here is even thinking about that. It's actually a really, really great thing. Atrial fibrillation is known to cause strokes. If a patient has a history of AFib, they should be on some type of blood thinner. Now we may find Xeralto or Eliquis as brand names of some medications are very, very common, but Coumadin, Warfarin uh, are drugs that may also be used, some of the older medications for that. Now, why does atrial fib happen? Now, if we get ventricular fibrillation, you die, right? Atrial fibrillation, though, you won't die. About two thirds of the blood falls from the atria into the ventricles passively. You open the valve, the blood goes through. It's not the best for your cardiac output, but since you don't get a good squeeze in those ventricles, blah, 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 they're just kind of wiggling around there, we still get circulation so we can live. However, blood clots can develop on the walls of the atria. They're on the walls, they're called mural thrombi. If one kicks loose, goes out the left ventricle, heads up the aorta and goes to the brain, boom. That's where the strokes come from and why blood thinners are so important for someone who has atrial fibrillation. All right, I'm going to go. So we're starting to level things out here a little bit more. I'm gonna go for trauma. I'm an EMS person at heart. Let's go for trauma, traumatic trivia for 400. The name for the pulse that is checked on the foot's dorsal surface. Now, I'm going to tell you, I gave you a little bit of a hint in this. The name for the pulse that's checked on the foot's dorsal surface. And I'm watching the chat and the conversations back and forth. You know, there's times today and politics and just stuff can be so tense. You know what we got to do? We got to take care of each other. We got to be there for each other. Even in this chat, we got people talking back and forth, supporting each other, making little jokes. That's what we need more of, especially in EMS. It is a pedal pulse. I'll give you that because it's the foot. However, the hint was dorsal, which makes it the dorsalis pedis pulse. That's one of the two pulses generally checked distally on the leg. The other behind that big old ankle bone um, is called the posterior tibial. So behind the big medial uh, malleolus um, is the posterior tibial pulse. All right. So I have a request here. Let me find that one. Clinical clues for 500. Somebody's going big. Go big or go home. Clinical clues for 500. Who a positive Markle sign indicates this. <laughs> oh, some rabbit holes developing in the chat. A positive Markle sign indicates this. Now, remember, 
I made these tougher as we go on. All right, so just remember that now we're at 500. This is not a common EMS thing, but it's something that we can know if we see it in a test question. A lot of these things won't be the answer, but there'll be distractors that are put in. Right In test-taking terminology, the question is the stem. Then you have a correct answer, and then three distractors, things that aren't the right answer. Things like this are sometimes put in uh, National Registry questions as distractors, or if you're getting really, really hard questions, you may find something like this. Markle's sign. <laughs> okay, our names are really going in a certain direction here. But it is correct. Peritonitis. Peritoneal inflammation. The Markle sign is also known as the heel drop test. Somebody gets up on their toes and lets their heel fall to the ground forcefully. If they feel that in their belly, it indicates peritoneal inflammation. Now, it's not a test that we normally, if they have abdominal pain, and I've palpated it and they have abdominal pain, I'm not quite sure I need to do that test. But if they're up and they're moving around, you say, let's try something. It indicates peritoneal inflammation, that lining of the belly. All right, we're going through. I'm going to do, I'll stay over in this neighborhood and do clinical clues for 400. We'll finish that category out. A blood pressure of 120 over 80 has this mean arterial pressure. Now, if you don't have paper in front of you, we actually have to do some calculating here. If you are using a cardiac monitor, using the non-invasive blood pressure, you will see 120 over 80, but usually in a little number off to the side, you will see the mean arterial pressure. The mean arterial pressure, some people look at as a much better sign. As a matter of fact, some cardiac monitors measure mean arterial pressure and then calculate it into a systolic over diastolic which I learned over the past couple of years myself. Now, the mean arterial pressure is different than the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure here is 40, but the mean arterial pressure, if you got your paper out there, it's the systolic blood pressure plus two times the diastolic blood pressure, get that number, and then divide it by three. Systolic plus two times the diastolic divided by three, which gives a mean arterial pressure of 93. Why is that important? Well, the surviving sepsis campaign says that in sepsis, you really should get the mean arterial pressure up to about 65. And here for reference, 120 over 80 is about 93. Because sometimes we're 90 over 60 or 80 over 55 and all of these different numbers, the mean arterial pressure is sometimes a better way to look at um, states of shock. So in that, 60 to 65 is generally the bottom. Once you're below that, we should be looking at shock. Systolic blood pressure, pressure plus two times the diastolic, take that number and divide it by three. I told you there'd be some tough ones in here doing that. That's how the monitor comes up with that number that you see there on the side. Bob Ross of Medical Education. I've got some characters in here tonight and I love it. Farm facts for 400. Patients who take furosemide usually also take this electrolyte. I think we already did trauma for 500. I think we may have wiped out. No, that was clinical clues. All right, we'll do, we'll do trauma next. Patients who take furosemide usually also take this electrolyte. Yeah, we're getting it. The medication may be called K-dur, K-D-U-R is one brand name. That K might be a clue. We're getting some of these. Possum, right theory, not exactly. 
We don't want our patient to play possum. K is for potassium. If someone is taking a certain amount of furosemide or Lasix and they aren't taking their potassium supplement, that may be an issue. Now, there are more potassium-sparing diuretics out there right now, but if it happens to be Lasix or furosemide after a certain dose, you will need those. It, some people say, well, I drink orange juice or bananas. A little bit of trivia here. It takes eight to 10 bananas to even start to give you what you would get in one dose of a potassium supplement. There's the Bob Ross trivia fact, if that really lights people up out there. And we had traumatic trivia for 500. Here it goes. This spinal injury syndrome frequently occurs in the elderly and involves upper extremity weakness more than lower. Oh, man. This spinal injury syndrome frequently occurs in the elderly and involves upper extremity weakness more than lower. Nice job, Elliot. There are three uh, that we generally talk about, three of these spinal injury syndromes. The elderly get this a little bit because of their anatomy and the way it tends to happen uh, with them, uh, partially because of uh, some of the things people mention here, because of uh, issues with the spine and the elderly. i me give you the correct answer here so we can move on. I do have some sample National Registry questions to do uh, after this. Uh, we'll get to those in a second. But the answer here is central cord syndrome. And the reason I put this in here is we kind of say, well, we either have the legs paralyzed or the arms and the legs paralyzed. Well, the fact is the way the spine is designed with anterior cord syndrome, brown saccard syndrome, and central cord syndrome, even has, each one has a definitive presentation. But here you see some of the things involved in central cord syndrome. If you're not familiar with those, that's a great thing uh, to look up. All right, I'm going to go to Medical Mysteries for 400. This diabetic condition isn't about glucose. It's about water balance. This diabetic condition isn't about glucose. It's about water balance. Sarah jumps in right off the bat. This is the answer to this is going to give you um, one of the distractors that sometimes you'll see. The correct answer here is people are calling up on the screen is diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a hormonal condition. The body um, has limited or no antidiuretic hormone. So there's nothing really to stop the person from peeing. So that means they pee a lot. Excessive urination has nothing to do with sugar whatsoever. Now, it's important to know that and what it is. But if you have a question about diabetes, this is a common distractor. Don't pick it unless you're looking for something that has to do with fluid and urination and nothing to do with diabetes. If you get hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, HHNS and diabetes insipidus, sometimes that's a distractor in the question just for people who don't know, say, oh boy, that's a really good one. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with sugar. All right, let's do the 400s. We'll wipe those out. Going to diagnostic dilemmas for 400. A difference in systolic blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury between the left and right arm may indicate this serious condition. A 
a difference in systolic blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury between the left and right arm may indicate this serious condition. We have a lot of three letter terms there. It's the last two might not be the first. And here's why. We have people saying triple A and triple A is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that abdominal aortic aneurysm may cause difference in pulse strength in the femoral pulse. In this case, this is an aortic aneurysm, but it's an ascending aortic aneurysm. As the left ventricle pushes blood out into the aorta, it goes up, it's ascending. And in the aortic arch, before the aorta starts to descend down through the chest into the belly, there are three vessels on top of that aortic arch. They feed our left and right extremities and our head. Should we have an aortic problem that affects those vessels, we may find that one of our extremities is not getting the same amount of blood flow and pressure. As a result, if I had a patient who says, oh, I've got this horrible pain in my chest. It feels like somebody's ripping or tearing my heart out. Ripping, tearing is aneurysm pain. And you say to yourself, hmm, that's it. Now, this is rare. I'll give you that. However, I want to check the blood pressure on both arms and check the pulses at the same time on the wrist to see if there's any difference in amplitude. That may give you an indication that you have this. Chronic hypertension. Um, connective tissue diseases may contribute to this. All right, you're welcome. That's, you know, with this challenging one, see, I love to teach everyone I picked. I can give you a little bit of a nugget, hopefully, that's going to help you in practice and on the National Registry. All right, going to Medical Mysteries for 500. This rare condition involves severe hypothyroidism, altered mental status, hypothermia, and slowing of organ functions. Oh, is this a 500 question or what? This rare condition involves severe hypothyroidism, altered mental status, hypothermia, and slowing of organ functions. From the comments we're getting here, the challenging jeopardy has been a, has been a hit. <laughs> TMB. Got a, too many birthdays. All right. I passed my National Registry exam in the first try because I watched a lot of Limmer videos on how to break down the question. Congratulations and thank you. All right, this question. We had a lot of people that are typing this in here, and the correct answer is the myxedema coma. Now, because it involves altered mental status, it's the myxedema coma. And there is a condition called myxedema that involves changes in the skin and lighter, lighter situations than this. But when you get into this myxedema coma, that's when you get that altered mental status. This is just an extreme um, hypothyroidism, an extreme state of hypothyroidism. And I believe we have one left, Diagnostic Dilemmas for 500. Here we go. This type of pain is vague and is experienced by abdominal organs. We touched on this a little bit in the appendicitis. This type of pain is vague and is experienced by abdominal organs. Look at y'all go. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. I've got two national, I have three national registry questions I want to do with you. Um, I like to try and get this done in an hour. So we have some great answers of visceral pain. 
Now, someone said dull, and visceral pain, visceral pain is often dull, right? Visceral means organ. They're not particularly well innervated. It might be nondescript. It might be more vague. That's how my students told me they remembered it. Visceral is vague. Now, peritoneal pain, when you involve the peritoneum, right, parietal peritoneum, when you get that pain, you can point right to it. Once that peritoneum is irritated, you know exactly where it is. But why does the appendix report and come back by the, by the belly button? Why do subdiaphragmatic organs sometimes show up in the shoulder? Because that's where they report back to the spine. And the brain just gets those signals, and it's not really clear the organs themselves. That's the challenge with abdominal pain. It's very difficult to figure out, and short of a CAT scan in the ambulance, we have to do it. Part of the other dilemma of abdominal pain is there are conditions that are incredibly painful, but not life-threatening, like kidney stones, and there are things that aren't particularly painful or easy to locate, and they are life-threatening. And that is the challenge when we do this. So let's go and do some National Registry slides. Here's the first question. Just type an A, B, C, or D in the chat. 25-year-old guy was involved in a car crash. He has a two-inch laceration on his forearm. His skin is warm, dry, and pink. His movement, sensation, and circulation are intact, distal to the injury. Bleeding is stopped. All right. He doesn't want to go. Which of the following must happen before you can allow him to refuse further care or transportation. Which of the following must happen? Now, I don't think anybody's going to argue this guy probably could drive himself to an urgent care, right? I don't think that that is necessarily wrong to have him uh, do that. But the correct answer here, choice C, he must understand the potential consequences of refusing, right? We don't have to call law, law enforcement. We can't make him sign the form. We really, we can't make him. He said, I'm not going to sign that form. We're going to say, you have to sign the form. I won't sign the form. You have to sign. It's not going to work. It doesn't go that way. Right? Can you, you must assess his vital signs. What if he says no? But what a refusal has to do is he's got to understand the consequences. What would I say to this guy? Listen, I get it. It's a two inch you know, lack on your forearm. We took good care of it, right? We can wrap it up. We can do it. It's not bleeding, but you might need some stitches. And if you don't do it soon, it's going to be a problem. If you don't, here's the risks. It may not heal. You may develop an infection. Infections of the skin can turn to sepsis. It could become serious. It could leave a worse scar if you don't do it. Give them all the things. You have to understand the consequences. That's the most important part of this question. The reason I chose this question is that we have a lot of mantra, right? Oh, you got to sign the form. Oh, call the cops to sign it. You know, the, you know, you have to assess his vital signs. Well, no, when you look at a National Registry question, remember Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other? Must, 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 but what's the most important? Understanding the consequences. All the other ones are nice, but they don't have to be. But one of them is the one that has to be, the true must. All right, let's go on to question number two. We'll get this done in about an hour. I promise. Thanks, you all, for doing this. Signing a refusal form is understanding the consequences. If we have a good refusal form, but we've got to make sure that we uh, explain everything to them verbally, especially about their condition. I do legal consulting sometimes, and people have cases, and you look at the documentation. Oh, I advised them of this, I advised them of this, advised them of this. But they're on scene for two or three minutes. Right? You've got to take time with refusals. Biggest causes of liability in EMS, ambulance crashes, patient refusal, and injury to patients, like when the stretcher tips over and stuff like that. So a refusal, even with a good refusal, if something happens, could you get sued? Yeah. But what you did on scene and your documentation is going to make a difference. 
All right, here's the next question. All right, while you're reading that, there's a question. I failed my national registry twice. Not a big test taker, any tips? Well, I always ask certain questions. Was your EMT class good? Did you study and prepare? Those are the first couple things I asked because I'm surprised at the time people say, well, my EMT class got out early every day and, you know, it wasn't a great class. And also sometimes people say, you know, I probably could have worked harder. So those things we got to look at first. So read the questions carefully, but don't read into them, right? The questions are going to give you all you need. When I took the National Registry last time, um, I covered the answers on the screen and I read the question twice, and then I looked at the answers. And some other things have miraculously popped up on the screen for tips, because we do have a lot of stuff that's there. Our remediation, I teach uh, 10 two-hour sessions plus do exam review. Um, if you didn't have a great class, come into that, and, and I think we can teach you. Which of the following respiratory conditions in children over two has a similar lung sound to an infant who has bronchiolitis? Bronchiole. What involves the bronchioles? Pertussis is whooping cough. Pulmonary edema. Two-year-old, not really likely. Plus, that kind of makes that little fine uh, crackles or rail sound. Pneumonia is kind of ronchi, rattly as that goes. And asthma. Asthma involves the bronchioles and wheezing. Correct answer, choice D for asthma. When you don't know what it's going to be, rule a couple out. And when you've got two of them, say, what's going to be? Bronchio, bronchiole is where the constriction happens in asthma, and it's what becomes inflamed in bronchiolitis. Pulmonary edema is fluid in the lungs. And our last national registry question. A 23-year-old female just delivered a full-term infant. You should first. 23-year-old female just delivered a full-term infant. You should first. All right, we got a variety of answers here. And you know what? I know that this is sometimes taught wrong. It's taught wrong a lot. And what's interesting is that this changed in the American Heart Association guidelines, the Immunity Resuscitation Program, about 12 years ago. Yet we still get hung up on suctioning. 23-year-old female just delivered a full-term infant. You should first dry and stimulate the baby. Choice A, we don't routinely suction. Even hospitals don't routinely suction. There can be a little bit of meconium around the face, but if that baby is moving and the baby's color is improving and they're crying, we're not going to suction them. Suction can cause bradycardia and hypoxia in a kid. And if we don't need to do it, we don't do it. We used to be taught, don't do this now. You know, the head comes out, just stop the delivery for a second, take the, take the bulb syringe and suction out the mouth and then the nose. But we don't do that now. We deliver the baby, we dry them, we warm them. That gives them some stimulation. And if they start to pink up and cry, we don't reach for the bulb syringe anymore. If we think that there's a problem with the airway and they're not thriving. Their pulse isn't over 100. The baby's not doing well. Okay, now it's time to think about resuscitation. Suction is no longer routinely done for an infant, a neonate, immediately after a delivery. All right, so that's not done routinely at all. Even if there's a little bit of meconium on the baby. Right. That's that's just so really, really important to do this. All right. I kept my promise. I kept this to about an hour. 
At the end here, those of you thinking about the National Registry, those of you who like a challenge, probably the most challenging app on the market are Limer Education's Pass apps, EMT, AEMT, and Paramedic Pass. If you want to be challenged more, this is the place to go. You can get more on LimerEducation.com. All right, we're going to shut this down for now. We're going to, like I said, keep this for an hour. Everyone here, thank you for your participation. The way you guys all got along in the group, it makes my night uh, doing this. I think the challenging Jeopardy was definitely popular. Perhaps the next one we can do challenging again or ultra challenging because uh, we're EMS people. And if we wanted routine all the time, we might not be an EMS. I think we all like a challenge. I'm happy to deliver that to you tonight. I'm Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. LimmerEducation.com. Please check us out. Y'all take care.